So yes, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to introduce uh, Ashwin De Wolf from Advanced Neural Biosciences. So he's uh, one of our very important and few people really spending 100% of his time in research for cryonics. So that's very important. We would like to have more of this uh, guys and I'm very happy to uh, introduce you and that you are here to present. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate to be here. Uh, I'm really grateful for, for being invited. Um, let me briefly say something about myself. Um, I've been involved with Cryonics for I think about 10 or 11 years. I, I became an Elcor member um, in, in 2002 and I've worked for Suspended Animation, the company in Florida that provides standby and stabilization services to the Cryonics Institute, and they also collaborate with Elcor a lot nowadays. Um, and then in um, 2008, we established our own uh, uh, company to research cryonics, and we were very explicit about that. You know, some companies who uh, do research relevant to cryonics, kind of, kind of keep it harsh, harsh. We, but we were very explicit about it from the start. And um, name of the company is Advanced Neurobiosciences. You kind of really deduce from that that it's, it's very much involved in cryonics. Um, over the years, we kind of moved from uh, what I would call investigating cryonics under realistic conditions, like introducing a lot of ischemia and then seeing what the effects are to more advanced models. So currently we're doing uh, a brain slice work and we're also doing whole brain uh, cryobiology. To, to my knowledge, we're one of the few, if not the, the only company right now that is actively pursuing a, a whole brain cryobiology model. Now, <laughs> I'm actually not going to talk about my, uh, my research today, although it's my understanding that Ben Best this morning um, uh, talked a little about, about, about the research we've done and some of the results. But what I want to talk about today is something that, that has been on my mind, and I think it's really relevant because we can do a lot of research, but eventually that research has to be translated you know, into some tangible technologies. So that's something I want to talk about today, like how do we identify things that could improve cryonics, how do we validate them, and then ultimately, how are they implemented, and if they're not implemented, if there are delays, what, what, what could be the reason for that? So I, th I think that's pretty relevant and practical. Um, so let, let, let's go on a brief journey from, from liquid nitrogen to cryonics. So in, in April 15, 1883, uh, there was the first uh, nitrogen was first liquefied. So you could say actually at that point it became technically feasible to do cryonics, at least at, at these really low temperatures. Um, then after 1945, um, um, uh, liquid nitrogen became widely commercially available. Then in 1962, uh, uh, Robert Adjinger uh, published um, The Prospect of Immortality, uh, the, the, one of the most important books, I think, for starting this whole thing. There was also a book by F. Cooper, but I think it, it didn't get the kind of recognition that uh, Bob Edinger's book got. And then in 1976, there was the cryopreservation of James Bedford. Now, there were earlier cryopreservations, but unfortunately, none of these people have made it. Uh, James Bedford is the earliest uh, cryopreserved person who is still cryopreserved today. He's at Alcor, and you can even see his, his old door there. So I want you to keep in mind uh, some of these data and, 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 and the kind of time frame for this if we move forward and look about the time frame in which neo cryonics technologies have been introduced. So this is technological and cryo progress in cryonics according to what I call them, like the outside world, the skeptics, they're thinking like, well, if you're working on cryonics, you must be working towards suspended animation, and it kind of looks like this. You go in some sophisticated chamber, and then you get, you know, uh, well, I wouldn't even call it resuscitated. You basically, you know, wake up from a sleep, and that's kind of the impression of a lot of people what cryonics research is all about. Now, 
this is basically what it means to us, technical, technological progress in cryonics. Uh, so they're storage vessels. Now there are different design possibilities, like a door or uh, a cryostat. And uh, things you need to research, like what, what are the boil-off rates? How long does it take for the liquid, liquid nitrogen to boil off? Um, what is the right diameter for a door? Clearly, if you wider diameters, you know, everything else is the same. You have lower boil-off rates. Um, how do we move patients in and out of doors? How do we protect them in doors? So uh, these are some of the practical issues involved with storage vessels. Crowd protectants, well, clearly, uh, unlike what, what a lot of outsiders still believe, uh, we do not just dump someone in liquid nitrogen. We want to protect them against ice formation. So what are good cryoprotectants? Glycerol, DMSO, mixtures of cryoprotectants. Uh, if they inhibit ice formation, are they toxic or not? Then there's called cardiopulmonary support. And I, I think that's even more obscure for, for outsiders to, because cryonics in, in, in reality is not uh, done under ideal conditions. People have to be, uh, pronounced legally dead, they go through a, a prolonged agonal phase, and we have to get these people to a cryonic facility to start cryoprotective perfusion. So that means we have to uh, keep the blood flowing to the brain, um, we have to cool them down rapidly, and uh, we also give a number of stabilization medications to prevent clotting, or if clots have been formed, to break up these clots. So as you can see, uh, cryonics research is not just just pushing forward towards uh, suspended animation. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, 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 I think, the ultimate goal, and I will come back to that point later. But there are a lot of practical research topics associated with cryonics that uh, are really, really important to actually do it. Um, so, yeah, so you can make progress without achieving that, that ultimate goal of human suspended animation. So there is safe and cost-effective cryogenic storage. There is reduction or even complete elimination of ice formation. There is elimination of ischemia. Uh, that is particularly important because if there is a prolonged period of ischemia that will translate itself into perfusion impairment in the brain and that again uh, can lead to ice formation because it's not really possible to distribute these cryoprotectants properly. So these, these issues are clearly related. Um, so what is the objective of a cryonics procedure? Let's say you know, there, there's a patient and uh, a cryonics organization has to intervene. Now at, at Alcor, at least, we say like the, the objective of a cryonics procedure is to maintain viability by uh, contemporary criteria. And what, what, what do I mean by contemporary criteria? What I mean is like, if we would, during any part of the, the procedure, try to reverse the whole thing, we would be successful. Now clearly, if we would be successful all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperature, I wouldn't be standing here and we would have human suspended animation. So the way it typically is being perceived is like we try to maintain viability by contemporary criteria and when we lose that, the secondary goal would be to uh, have very good ultrastructural preservation. So does the brain still look good on the ultrastructural level after doing our procedures? So what's the current status? I, I said I would not be talking too much about research today, but some, some important uh, uh, landmark studies I, I, I want to review briefly so we have kind of a benchmark to see where we are and to compare that to what we can do in the field. Now, I, I think still the most meaningful paper published supporting cryonics is uh, a paper published by Yuri Pachugin and Greg Fay in cryobiology in 2006. And it reported the recovery of viable red hippocampal slices after vitrification. Now, Greg Fay, of course, has done a lot of kidney work, but uh, the brain is, I think, even if you're a whole body patient, is still like what is really important. So we really want to know what the effect of our cryopreservation protocols is on, uh, on the brain. And what they found is with the newer generations of vitrification solutions, uh, 
that they were able to recover uh, viability, and viability was measured by uh, potassium-sodium ratio uh, of red hippocampal slices after vitrification. So that's kind of the state of the art in, in the published literature. Now, not, not long after publication of that paper um, at the uh, suspended animation conference in Florida, there was an announcement uh, by 21st century medicine that they had been able to maintain long-term potentiation, LTP, like the process that is usually presumed to be involved in, in long-term memory consolidation, uh, to maintain it after vitrification of rabbit brain slices. Now, these studies were published in, well, they haven't been published yet, and that announcement was in, in 2007, and I think I'm gradually trying to, leading up to the theme of my talk is like how do these uh, uh, experimental findings are translated into uh, tangible procedures and are they going to get published? Um, so what's the current state in chronics? I mean, how can we say that if we have such good results in the peer-reviewed literature that we can, you know, duplicate them in a real chronics case? Well, that's hard. But there's an assumption. So the assumption is right now, and I, I, I wrote uh, an article about it for Chronics Magazine called Securing Viability of the Brain in Human Cryopreservation. In an ideal case, we assume that cerebral viability is assumed to be lost somewhere during cryoprotectant perfusion due to cryoprotectant toxicity and CPA-induced dehydration. So, so what we basically think is, in, in a really ideal case, and let, let's just say one in which the hospital or hospital is extremely cooperative, the patient is not like in, in septic shock or has gone through a prolonged, you know, agonal phase, a, a, a chronic organization can intervene quite rapidly. We cool down quite rapidly. We give all the stabilization medications. Um, and um, then, we, then we cool down, wash out the blood, and start introducing the cryoprotectant. Our current understanding based on extrapolation from the literature is that somewhere in the early to middle stages of doing cryoprotectant perfusion, viability of the brain is lost. Um, um, there are a number of reasons for why we cannot push uh, the results of that I, that I identified in these papers so far in cryonics, and one of them is that, like, the conditions under which we do cryonics are, are very different from, from the lab. Um, for example, M22, uh, the reason why that vitrification solution has that name is that it's actually introduced at minus uh, 22 degrees Celsius. Prior to that, there is a different solution with lower toxicity that precedes that solution. Now, in Keranics, we, we use M22 straight away, so that's probably quite a bit more toxic. And we certainly do not go to these really low temperatures for introducing M22. We, uh, minus three, minus five are the lowest temperatures that that uh, that M22 is being perfused in cryonics, and as I just said, M22 is not even introduced at all at these kind of temperatures in in the lab. Another really important reason why we think that it's almost inevitable that we lose cerebral viability uh, at least midway during cryoprotective perfusion is uh, uh, the dehydration cost by cryoprotectant perfusion. Um, as some of you may know, if you do a prolonged perfusion with a high concentration of a cryoprotectant in the brain and the blood-brain barrier is still intact and the patient is not ischemic, you will get severe dehydration of that brain. In fact, as, as paradoxical as it may sound, severe dehydration often in cryonics is being perceived as actually a really good indicator of, uh, of good cryopreservation and uh, that there was not a whole lot of ischemia going on prior to starting the procedure. Um, can, can we investigate if we lose viability uh, in, a, in an actual cryonics case, like where I said where I think we were losing it? Well, yes, we, we could take microliter uh, brain biopsies, for example, during cryoprotectant perfusion and subject them to uh, a viability assay, or we can subject them to electron microscopy. And there's currently, uh, at least at Alcor, I know, uh, a lot of discussion about uh, implementing that. And as you can imagine, there, 
there are some concerns about it because you would be basically extracting a very, very small piece from the brain for experimental validation. Now, actually, taking very small microliter samples of the brain is, is kind of uh, not uncommon in mainstream medicine. Uh, and there are not, to, to my knowledge, very adverse consequences. But as you can see, if you have to do that in a chronic facility, you know, things can go wrong. Um, you have to make burr holes to do it. Um, so there are concerns about it. But in theory, it should be possible during a chronic case to kind of gather that kind of information. I want to talk about three technological developments that I would call pending. Um, one is liquid ventilation. I just, just out of curiosity, who, who knows what, what liquid ventilation is? Okay. So I will briefly say something about it. So in a typical chronic case, when the patient is pronounced legally dead, um, we immediately put the, the patient in an ice bath and start cardiopulmonary support and start the cooling as, as quickly as we can. But by necessity, that, that, is, that is external cooling. And external cooling, especially in you know, an organism as big as a human, is, is fairly slow. Now, one alternative would be to put the patient immediately on bypass, you know, access the vessels and run a really cold solution through, through the body or, or, or the brain. But as you can see in, in a field situation, that is, that, is, that is not particularly practical. So one proposal was to, um, to use uh, a liquid to ventilate the lungs. This, 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 this technology goes back way to the 50s where they discovered that mice could breathe uh, uh, in, in liquid. And the idea is like the lungs, all the, all the blood in the body goes through the lungs. So if you would cycle in and out a very cold liquid in and out of the lungs, that would really speed up uh, cooling on the patient. So that's where that idea came from. Second technology, intermediate temperature storage. Uh, the rationale behind that is like um, modern vitrification solutions vitrify around minus minus 20, minus 130, minus 120, minus 130. You go below that and there's a lot of thermal stress building up and eventually that translates itself into fracturing. So basically, the point here is we, we're storing actually lower than would be responsible. And uh, there have been various proposals to, um, to store patients at higher temperatures. Field cryoprotection, um, well, the phrase field cryoprotection, you used to hear a lot about field vitrification. That would basically be mean that instead of transferring a patient from wherever the patient is pronounced and we do the procedure uh, to a chronic facility, we do the cryoprotectant perfusion in the field. Now, you could even do the vitrification in the field, but then you would have to ship the patient back in a, in a, in a, in a very bulky door, especially with a whole body patient, and it would not be particularly practical. So. That's why we talk about field cryoprotection instead of field vitrification. All right. Um, so here are some, again, some, um, some dates involving liquid ventilation. So uh, Clark and his group demonstrated the idea of liquid breeding in rodents in 1966. Then in 1995, Mike Darwin proposed liquid ventilation as a technology for induction, for rapid induction of hyperthermia in cryonics. And then in 2005, suspended animation, I was there at the time actually, and critical care uh, research, it says here critical medicine, but it's actually critical care research in California started collaborating on a prototype of that technology that could be used in cryonics. Intermediate temperature storage. Uh, in an interview in 1987, Alcor President Mike Darwin proposed vapor storage at, medium, at intermediate temperatures as a research direction. In 1997, uh, Hugh Hickson introduced, Hugh Hickson is a an, an, uh, longtime employee at Alcor, he introduced uh, a device called the crack phone. He, he, he made it all himself, and basically he used acoustic signals to, to, as, a, as a proxy for how much fracturing there's going on in a patient or the brains of patient. Then in 2000, uh, Alcor acquired the Cryostar, which is an electrical a uh, very low temperature freezer that runs around minus 140. Uh, 
So you could conceivably s store uh, a patient in there. Well, that would have to be a, a, a neuro patient because they're not particularly big and <laughs> they wouldn't, wouldn't fit. But that, Elcor acquired that with, with the aim of validating that technology. Now in 2003, Elcor acquired uh, a prototype of a neuropod. So that was basically an ITS, uh, intermediate temperature storage, uh, specifically designed prototype for holding uh, 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 neuro patients at intermediate temperatures. Then in 2008, Elcor acquired a real ITS NeuroDuor, so that was not a prototype, but something that was validated, validated to, to run for extended periods for use. And um, in 2014, and that's kind of interesting, um, 21st Century Medicine started reporting some of their uh, poor signs, there are some of their PIC studies, and they were able to, um, to cool uh, whole pigs to around 130 with negligible or, or no fracturing. Um, when they cooled to minus 140, they, they, got, they got some fractures, but not a whole lot. But when they just cooled to just below the glass transition temperature, the, they almost didn't see anything at all or in, in, in whole body uh, patients that would often involve uh, fracturing in, in, in areas that even like contemporary surgery could fix. So that, was, that was pretty encouraging because one of the reasons why um, that technology has been quite controversial is because some people said, well, if you cannot eliminate any fracturing at all, what's the point? Or we do actually see actually a lot of fractures above uh, the glass transition temperature already. Um, so th these results were very encouraging. Well, I, here's a photo of um, the, the ITS unit at Alcor that's currently actually in operation and has patients in it. Um, yeah, you can see quite well there. Yeah, so on the, on the left you can actually see how it looks from the inside. So there's a pool of liquid nitrogen in the bottom and there is some insulation and then patients are stored and there's again insulation and door lit. Um, Briefly, the way it works is if you, of course, have liquid nitrogen and you would place a patient in it, well, the patient would be at 196. And if you would place in that vapor, then, of course, the temperature would be higher. And if you elevate it more, it would be higher and higher. So the way it works is to basically have a pool of liquid nitrogen and then pre introduce some insulation so you can kind of tweak that temperature in which the patient is being held. Now, the elegance of this system, and I, a lot of people don't know that, um, is that if it would not function anymore, if there would be, because there is an electrical component that looks at the temperature, but if it would not be functioned, the temperature would drop. So there is no concern in intermediate temperature storage that if it doesn't work, you know, a patient would fall out, the temperature would drop. It wouldn't be great because if you have a patient that previously didn't have any fractures, it would drop to a temperature. But at least it is a better safeguard than, you know, being dependent on a system in which patients would fall. So I, I think it's very important to mention it here because it's still a misunderstanding about intermediate temperature storage. So why, why did I put that question mark there when I said ITS at Elcor? So there is this unit, and there are patients in it, but Elcor does not formally offer it. Um, at some points, uh, crack phone data were so encouraging that they decided to put these patients into uh, intermediate temperature storage. But it's, it's still not formally um, offered by Elcor. And there are a lot of complicated technical reasons for that that I cannot go into, but um, it, 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 it's good to recognize that it's kind of a hybrid technology right now. It's kind of deployed, but not. Um, field crowd protection. Well, field crowd protection was conceived in, well, it, it's actually as old as Kranich itself, but because only when you have a designated facility, uh, the, whole, the whole point of field crowd protection becomes meaningful, because in the old days, people were often crowd protected in uh, uh, a funeral home or a garage or whatever. So it's only since we have like bigger designated cryonics facilities that we can talk about that. Now, field cryo protection is another example 
although there's a lot of like debate whether we should introduce it, if so, in what cases, in which cases we would apply it, um, what the protocols would be. It, it's interesting to note that this technology actually has been used already, uh, field country has been done twice, uh, as far as I'm aware, at least in the history of, uh, of, of Alcor, and there was also a uh, collaboration between SA and the American Chronics Institute. Uh, in 1999, there was a case in Australia in which the patient was perfused with glycerol and then shipped on dry ice, and in 2004, and I was working at uh, SA at the time, there was um, um, a case as well in which the patient was uh, at the funeral home, perfused with glycerol, um, and shipped on dry ice to the Chronics Institute, who does the storage for ACS. So the, the status currently is on field crowd protection, Elcor has authorized it now for, for, for its overseas cases. And, and the reason for that is, <laughs> kind of a cynical reason, but as much as we would like to, we see a lot of overseas cases still ending up being a straight freeze. Now, even a rudimentarily but competently done field crowd protection would be better. So that was kind of an easy decision to make. And, and my understanding is CI has made a, a similar decision for their uh, overseas patients. So now I want to get back again to these technical developments that I was talking about. Um, so liquid ventilation was like proposed and the work started on that in 1995. And it's currently, it has not been implemented in chronics yet. So that, that's, that, that, that's a long time ago. Um, intermediate temperature storage was first envisioned and started to get explored in 1987. It had still not been formally introduced in the field. Field crowd protection, well, as I said, is kind of as old as chronics itself. So basically, if we would introduce it, we, we would be kind of full circle. But uh, it's still not universally practiced by, by any chronics organization. If you, if you remember when I went back to Robin Edinger writing his book about chronics, and it was, I think, only five or six years later that the first person was crowd preserved and put into long-term storage. And we look at these technological developments and they seem to be taking quite long. So why does it take so long? And I think that there are really good reasons for it sometimes, but I think there's also reasons for that I think that are not so good. Or perhaps if we would recognize them, we could accelerate that progress. Well, one thing has to do, I think, with the nature of chronics uh, itself. There is no real clinical feedback. Well, there's a caveat to that, but there's no clinical feedback. If you, if you do cryopreservation case, uh, unlike in mainstream medicine, the patient will not, at least not at this point, come back and you can say, okay, that worked. So all cryonics cases in the same, in a sense, end the same way. They go into do war and, you know. Um, as a consequence, there's also little member feedback because <laughs> if you would send a conventional patient for, for bypass and a patient would come back, or there would be some very innocent procedure, but well, there would be hell to pay, right? Or uh, when uh, a, a hospital would use a very outdated technology, there would be a lot of outrage from the public. We don't really have that in chronic. And I think these two things are related. There is no, not real clinical feedback, so therefore there's not a whole lot of feedback from members. I mean, how, I, I think there might be around 10 chronic cases a year. I mean, how much real, debate and assessment is there of these cases, like how well we, did we do and so forth. Then there's technological optimism. Um, I, I will get to that point, that's how I underlined it. Um, there's cost, and I, I think cost is a really, really good reason, and I would say good excuse too, because a lot of these uh, technologies uh, cost a lot of time to, to investigate, to validate. For example, intermediate temperature storage, my understanding, liquid nitrogen consumption is three times as high as, as for conventional uh, uh, long-term storage. So you could see that, especially in organizations like Alcor, who already has problems retaining members because of high cost and, and high dues, is very reluctant to introduce a technology, especially if it replaces the older technology that is substantially more expensive. So I, I think that, that makes sense. 
And then there are institutional staff changes. It, 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 may, not, it may have occurred to, to some of you that if you look at chronic organizations over a longer stretch of time, you often see a lot of people uh, you know, who just don't work there anymore. And the presidents of Koranix organizations seem to change every couple of years. It has now stabilized a little, and I, I think that's good. But with these changes, there are different priorities. So you could be working on one project uh, one day, and then there's a new staff change, and you can be put on some other projects. So in all these three projects I was talking about, uh, it's not the case that they are being pursued every day. And uh, it's, it's more like someone says, well, I think it would be really interesting and important to introduce these technologies, and then you know, we get on the, on, on the bandwagon again. But it's not like these kind of technologies are being pursued continuously, and any kind of setback can reflect uh, technical or cost issues. And then there's the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about that as well. Well, technological optimism. Um, I think one of the most popular phrases in Quranics is uh, a technology that can do X should be able to do this or that as well. Um, it, I think it's most commonly used, of course, in the defense of neuropreservation, a technology that can reverse aging and do all kind of advanced repairs at uh, the molecular level should be able to, you know, create a new body uh, based on, you know, the patient's DNA. Um, but the, the technological optimism can stretch a little further because if you're of the opinion, and actually I, I'm quite partial to the perspective myself, that it's very hard to irreversibly destroy information, uh, you can be very optimistic about inferring the original state of something from its damaged state. And uh, in a way, subconsciously, they can start affecting how, wh what do you think is a priority in a cryonics organization? So, and there are actually cases, I, I think people would not really go public with that, but there's certainly good examples in cryonics where people said like, well, we can do these kind of technological innovation, but it's mostly just good PR because our preservation should already be sufficient to allow meaningful resusc resuscitation of the patient in, in, in the future. So that's technological optimism. Um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I'm going to give three examples. Uh, let's talk about low toxicity vitrification. I, I think it's kind of a misunderstanding. Vitrification itself is actually not really hard to do. If you take just a very high concentration of a cryoprotectant or a mix of two very strong glass formers, uh, it will not freeze. But what, what we ideally want is low toxicity vitrification. So, uh, vitrification was introduced in Quranics at Alcor in 2000. And it basically coincided with the time that uh, associated research labs, like 21st, uh, 21st century medicine, were able to design vitrification agents that had at least uh, low enough toxicity to recover organs with some degree of viability. Now, this is an interesting question because let's, let, let's rewind a little back to, let's say, the, the early 80s, where most patients uh, either were frozen or had a substantial degree of freezing, which even like these, these higher toxicity vitrification agents would have, would they, uh, would have been an improvement over uh, what was then. I mean, ice formation, I did a lot of myth about ice formation, but it's still pretty serious mechanical damage. So I, I think perhaps the case could have been made that even the higher toxicity vitrification solutions uh, would for cryonics have made a lot of sense at that point. Um, another example, uh, portable liquid ventilation. Now, one of the problems with, with liquid ventilation is that under that rubric go a lot of different realization of the technology. You can, for example, just take a physiological solution, pump it in the lungs, uh, you know, get it out, pump it in again. That is, I think, the most basic incarnation of liquid ventilation. Then you can use uh, perfluorocarbon and have a, a very fine-tuned, uh, automated, computerized uh, device to pump the liquids in and out. 
but if you do that, of course, then there's a problem. How, how are we going to transport that equipment? Is it too fragile to be put on an airline? And an organization like Suspended Animation uh, often has to fly to different parts of the country to do a case. So they would have to have something portable. But then again, you can ask, okay, if, if portability is uh, such, a, such an important thing, uh, but is it an important thing for a local case? Can we then at least not introduce that technology for local cases? And about, uh, I don't know, Max, how many co cases are local for Alcor, would you say? Yeah, so at least a third of the cases for an organization like Elcor are local cases. So you, you might argue that you, you could introduce the technology, at least in local cases, if everything else works fine. Um, Fracture-free storage. Um, so clearly this has to do with intermediate temperature storage. I, th I think one, one thing that has really prevented uh, intermediate temperature storage from being pursued more aggressively and introduced is this ideal of like, well, if we cannot, uh, I, I, I talked about it a little earlier, if we cannot eliminate any kind of fracture, uh, then, then it's probably not a good idea. But if you think about it, let's say uh, you have only, you know, uh, a fracture in the spleen or just in, in, in a leg. I mean, even by contemporary technologies that, that can be fixed. Um, also, I, 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 what, what was going on there is that cryonics is typically done in, in kind of messy conditions. And I, I think it's, it, it, it would not be an exaggeration to say that at least 90% of the cases there is some degree of ischemia. That ischemia will translate itself in perfusion impairment. Perfusion impairment will translate itself in ice formation. And ice will of course fracture at a much higher temperature so one of the, I think, erroneous conclusions for, for a while in cryonics was, well, we see fracturing at higher temperatures, so therefore the idea of eliminating fracturing below the glass transition point is kind of an illusion because we see it already at higher temperature. But as I think we increasingly come to understand, a lot of that uh, fracturing was due to ice formation that would be absent in a properly, you know, uh, vitrified case. So, and this is my, my, my last slide. So how can we accelerate progress in cryonics? Now, <laughs> it's just one slide and, and these, are, you know, by definition must be very subjective suggestions, but uh, I want to go back to that slide I showed about suspend animation. That's kind of the perception that people have what cryonics is, or at least what we are working towards to. But in a way, it is good. I, I think, no cryonics organization, to my knowledge, has a formal research objective. And I think, or even a, a, a formal clinical objective, and I think it would be good to at least aim for human suspended animation because it will provide a benchmark to evaluate each and every case or any technology to see how far we are uh, moving towards that goal. If there is no clinical goal, if there is no experimental goal, it's very hard to, to say which uh, technologies are important, which technology would make a lot of uh, meaningful, imp uh, constitute a lot of meaningful improvement. Um, to improve case monitoring. Um, I earlier said there is no clinical feedback in chronics. Well, of course, clearly that cannot be true if you really would look carefully at a case because throughout each step of a cryonics procedure, there are a lot of things you can measure to see how well you're doing. Um, you can, for starters, of course, uh, look at how long the delay is between pronouncement of legal death and the start of a cryonics procedure. Then you can look at uh, the cooling, uh, cooling rate. Then you can look at how well is the patient ventilated. Let's look at expired CO2, which is a very good indicator of how well uh, the patient is being perfused and how, how good cerebral blood flow is. Um, in the operating room during cryoprotective perfusion, there are all kinds of things we can do. Most recently, um, Alcor has started doing uh, CT scans for their patients, uh, for their neuro patients at least, because they have to take these patients to another facility, which would be a little impractical with whole body patients. But um, 
um, they, they can do now do CT scans and they can actually see the degree of dehydration and the degree of perfusion impairment and ice formation. And we can correlate that to like, well, if there was a lot of ischemia, you would expect to see more perfusion impairment and ice formation. And I, I have not systematically looked at these things, but that, that, that pretty much turns out to be the case. So, so there's a lot of you can do in terms of case monitoring. Um, Along the same lines, you can quantify damage for each case. You, you can kind of create a, a sort of global metric in which you say like, okay, um, ischemia, cooling rate, we put these things together. We, well, this is kind of simplistic, but we give this case a uh, seven out of 10, you know, relative to what is technologically possible for, for, for a cryonics organization to do. And if you commu communicate these, these findings clearly, especially against the framework of achieving human suspended animation, then people say, oh look, we're moving in the right direction. Or they say like, well, but we see fracturing in every case, so now I really understand why we need in intermediate temperature storage. So uh, communication, of course, of these results is very important too. And four is targeted cryonics, uh, uh, R and D, and and that goes back to the point I made about institutional and staff um, um, reasons for progress sometimes being a lot slower. It would be good if you could just say, well, we put these one and two people just really on this project, and not like five and six other projects, as as often the case in chronics. But that is really what they're working on, and they need to complete that. And um, and clearly. Uh, it's only now we have more established chronics organization, more money that, that we can do that. But I, I, I think the time is, is right for that. So um, I think the short, the short version of my story is I think there are a lot of technological projects in chronics that move not as quickly as I think they can. And I think we need to really think about how to accelerate it, and especially like for Europe, when you, when you still have to establish a storage facility, you can really think and, and study how this has been done in America and uh, try to learn from that. So uh, I'm glad to take any questions about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwin, for this nice talk. Other questions? Thorsten? Hi, this is a question about uh, sort of the current vitrification technology and uh, from the case protocols, I'm well aware of what you talked about, that there is massive dehydration of the brain, massive shrinkage. Mm -hmm. So maybe to <laughs> sort of um, a bit provocative question, I mean, if the blood brain barrier is still intact, is the brain actually perfused with CPAs? Or could you basically use any high osmolarity solution and the result would be the same? Well, when you think about blood brain barrier permeability of cryoprotectants, it, it, it's not the case that they don't go through at all. Uh, especially, I mean, we know that because we don't see any uh, freezing in well vitrified brains, but that is also partly due to their dehydrated state. So the current understanding of vitri brain vitrification actually is that it is, that is a combination of uh, dehydration and cryoprotectants. Now the most obvious uh, suggestion would be, well, why don't you, you know, modify, break open the blood-brain barrier? And actually there has been some work on it. And uh, in, in, in clinical medicine, that's often being done by using mannitol. Um, or hypertonic saline uh, solution like that, but that doesn't seem to really work like that in chronics. You really have to come up with something a little bit more harsher, and that also uh, indicates, I think, the problem, because what do these molecules do overall to viability? I mean, a, a molecule that is really potent enough to like really, really disrupt the blood-brain barrier may also have adverse effects on endothelial cells or cell membranes in general. And actually one thing that we're looking on our lab now is, is looking at these uh, blood-brain barrier modifiers and to see if we administer them how, how it affects uh, viability. And the second thing I want to say about it is like dehydration has always been kind of considered to be a, a, a double-edged sword in, in, in cryonics. We do not like to see it, but we 
also do like to see it because it's an indicator of, of little ischemia and very good cryoprotectant perfusion. Uh, I was recently involved in a, in a dog cryopreservation and we thought it had gone really well and then the, the brain was extracted and the brain had not shrunk at all. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, that didn't go as well as we thought it did. And then later, uh, when that brain was expected for ice formation, it was not informa ice formation at all. And that was in a dog. That was a cryopreservation of a pet. And then later, um, Alcor reported seeing a similar phenomenon in, in, in a case that they also believe they've done fairly well. And there is also some evidence from... Uh, from the 90s, where very good electron micro, uh, electromicrographs were obtained uh, in dogs after cryopreservation. So maybe the dog is an animal uh, whose brain seems to be a lot, blood brain barrier is a lot more permeable to cryoprotectants. I mean, it's not just a large or small animal thing. Uh, it, it's really strange. It, it's something someone really has to look into. And if dog brains are a lot more permeable to cryoprotectants, why that is and what we can learn from it from humans. I may a uh, short follow-on question. Uh, when does the blood, like how much after the heart stops does the blood-brain barrier break down? Because I know it does sometime after death. And might people whose blood-brain barriers have uh, broken down even get a sort of better vitrification than those where it's still intact? And again, a bit provocative. Well, um, the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier is like a progressive thing. It's not like it is there or it's not there. It's like progressive injury to uh, you know, the, the blood-brain barrier. And one thing we have seen in our lab, and I think Jure Pachugan has observed it also in his research when he uh, worked for CI, is that progressively the amount of shrinking of the brain gets less and less and less. And about into, you get into 24 hours of cold ischemia or one hour of warm ischemia, there is a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that doesn't permit any uh, dehydration anymore. Now you could say like, well, that's great. Then you can better perfuse that brain. But the problem is that is because of ischemia and that very ischemia produces perfusion impairment and leads actually to poor equilibration of the cryoprotectant. Now, of course, there would be like a middle of the road, so to say, in which you would break down the blood-brain barrier in the absence of ischemia. And that's something that is being looked at uh, by, by our lab and also by 21st century medicine right now, yeah. Just on that last slide, Ashton, um, two, three, and four, um, a case could be made that those aren't potentially ideally positioned within the chronics providers themselves but that there ought to be some kind of independent mechanism to score cases and monitor or audit and uh, even do R&D potentially. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think that, that's really an, an excellent point. And, and since, since I've been involved in Chronic, there have been several proposals to create an, an independent organization that's, that sets standards for the whole field and would evaluate the quality of cases. Now, there are a number of... Um, challenges here. Uh, the first one is recruitment of people. It's, it's already very hard to recruit people for cryonics to do cryonics and uh, it would be even harder to find people who would staff such an organization. I don't know how much time would be involved, maybe initially not a whole lot, but that, that's one challenge. The other thing is, and that I think is a real uh, challenge, Different cryonics organizations have different perspectives on cryonics, most notably the Cryonics Institute and Alcor. So if you set a set of standards, what would that be? Would it be CI's uh, standards? Would it be Alcor's? Would it be something independent? But if you set a standard that is too close to the protocol of one organization, one organ the other organization said, well, we don't really accept you know, the verdicts or the conclusions of these organizations. Now, of course, you can say, well, fair enough, you don't have to, then people just know that you're not a particularly good chronics organization. I can, I can see that perspective. But um, how to set a standard for the field is hard because implicit in setting a standard is actually saying that you know that something works and something else doesn't work, at least in a lot of cases. So I, I think that, that that might be a challenge as well. So as we have only one talk left, so maybe I can also ask a question. 
So we, you uh, very in, in detail explained a lot of uh, steps, uh, mm. also in techno technological progress. Mm. And let's say one very big step was the use of cryoprotectiva compared to a straight freeze, mm. which like increased uh, probably of a whole success, whatever this means, by a really huge factor. Uh -huh. Do you see any more such really big step uh, in mind with, which could come? So th that's a really interesting question. It, it made me think about some of the points I made. I, I think maybe one reason why the passion for some of these technologies that I identified as important may not be that big is like this paradigm change from freezing to not freezing has been perceived as so fundamental that a lot of it is kind of like tinkering around with it. And and to be truthful, I mean, there is, there, there is some credibility to that perspective because if you would try to look at very subtle differences in cryoprotecting toxicity in electron micrographs, I, I wouldn't be able to see that, I, I know. So um, if your perspective on cryonics is that it is basically structural preservation and you do not care a whole lot, let's say about viability, then you could argue, well, we're already there, we just have to make sure we just bring more people in that rubric of uh, uh, ice-free cryopreservation. But my perspective is that that sounds all good and well, but if we want to make a strong case to the rest of the world, we really have to move to the goal of uh, human suspended animation, so where we can basically say, okay, this, this, this patient is critically ill, but we place him in a condition or her that is reversible even by contemporary standards, so the cryonics process itself doesn't cause any damage anymore. I've called that uh, cryonics without repair. So that would be my perspective. But uh, I can certainly see uh, why there has been, among some people, a lot less enthusiasm to push uh, some of the progress much harder, especially like with fracturing. That is another example where I've heard a lot of people say like, well, <laughs> if you can make repairs on a molecular level, it should not be very hard, you know, to, to heal, uh, you know, a fracture. And that's probably true. But I, I don't think it's good for the public image uh, or the whole idea of patient care to, to stop here. Um, if I would have to choose... Uh, a technology that I think would be most important right now to pursue it would be field vitrification or field cryoprotection. And the reason for that is, is although we have this great vitrification technology, I think it can fairly reasonably be assumed that not a whole lot of patients are fully benefiting from that because they're being pronounced legally dead, like in, in locations very far away from the facilities. There's a lot of ischemia. That ischemia, as I said earlier, translates itself into perfusion impairment. You get a lot of ice formation. So we have this great vitrification agent, but despite of that, there's still a lot of ice formations. So I think you're going to see in the near future in Karanics a lot more emphasis on how do we bring more people into this uh, uh, ice-free cryopreservation in, in reality. And field cryoprotection would, of course, be a very good development there because you can pretty much start right away uh, where the patient is being pronounced legally dead with doing cryoprotectant perfusion. So that would be my uh, priority if I had to pick one of the three that I, that I talked about. In this direction, do you think something like toxic-free magnetic freezing can ever be possible for cryonics? So. Yeah, I have heard a lot about it, and that is really not my background, and I have not not a whole lot of... Uh, some people that I do really trust their judgment do not think it's a very feasible technology, and I kind of defer to them, uh, but I cannot say anything personal about that, no. Thank you very much. All right.